and I think we'll make a start. Hi everyone, I'm Annalyn Sarkin, I'm Senior Knowledge Information Officer at Field Fisher. I'm also Chair of the PR Committee for FILE. Um, a real pleasure to introduce Daniel Bates to this um, session on multimedia. <laughs> Our use of multimedia um, in your um, to sell your wares, as it were, as the library. Particularly, I'm interested because I've been working with Daniel on videos for, that will go on the VAR website and using that kind of thing to promote law librarianship and file. So, I just want to learn a bit more about what we've briefly started together by coming to this session. And yeah, over to you, Daniel. <laughs> Thanks, Annalie, for the introduction. Uh, what I actually wanted to say to you straight from the get-go was that um, the, uh, I'm at the Faculty of Law at the University of Cambridge. Our media collection that I've built now has had in excess of 1.5 million views, which is actually more than any book that has been published by any of the authors that we've got at the faculty, certainly individual um, editions, some of them you know, editions that have been going for centuries possibly have reached that sort of number. Um, so what I'm hopefully going to talk to you about today is um, to just the, 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 the simple basics of how to produce these sorts of um, either audio or video uh, snippets or pieces that you can use uh, to uh, either use for education or that you can use for um, uh, broadening uh, the PR or the communications of your department. Um, and also looking at how to distribute those um, uh, and just distribute that content more effectively. Okay, so um, I think it says on my Twitter uh, bio that I'm a, a lawyer and a closet geek. Um, but most of you that speak to me will know that it's not that closet really anymore. <laughs> um, and certainly I've brought a few toys. You'll know that I, I, I don't really travel anywhere without toys either. So I've, I've brought a few toys that I might hold up. Um, as part of this, just to say, you know, here's some interesting equipment that we use. Um, so I teach legal research skills at the faculty at Cambridge, and then in the last 10 years I've been branching out a lot more, and the role's become uh, very much, it has a dimension of communication, um, uh, both internally, uh, so with the students, we're obviously doing a lot more uh, sort of online VLE uh, video um, kind of things to teach the students, as well as going to lectures and supervisions. Um, and then also, as I said, we've got... Um, probably in the region of about a thousand media items now and we're creeping rapidly towards the 1.6 million views um, and I think I said in the introduction to this uh, that I put in the book I'm really pleased because we've overhauled Kings at last. Um, Kings, I, I, I'm going to speak a little bit about analytics at some point later on, I don't know whether I'm going to get time to it, but Kings has an extremely spiky analytical trend and what happens is they catch us up every Christmas. It's so annoying because they put carols at, at King's <laughs> on their media collection and they get this massive spike for no more than a week and catch us up. And then the rest of the year, I'm, I'm pulling ahead and pulling ahead. So I think this is the year that I've actually got them. Okay. Um, so in this presentation, what I'm going to do, I'm going to split roughly 50-50. Um, I'm going to speak for the first half a little bit about some of the practical steps. Um, so if you're not particularly technical or you don't necessarily carry all the toys around, just some of the, uh, just to really sort of demystify it, to, to make you realise that you're probably, um, you've already got in a cupboard or maybe even in your pocket the kinds of equipment that can produce a fairly creditable result if you do it carefully. Um, and then in the second half I want to talk about some of the platforms. I mean YouTube is going to be one of the major platforms we talk about, but I want to talk about iTunes, SoundCloud, things like that as well. Um, and how you can really... Um, use all of these things to mine the knowledge and experience that you've already got and get it out there into the organisation. Okay, so I hope I'm going to be able to encourage you to get doing some of these things. Um, and certainly, so from my academic perspective, we're seeing more and more that there is a push towards getting audiovisual material out to the students. Um, you know, there's a whole range of opportunities through VLEs and things like that. And certainly I know that our lecturing staff now, and this is even Cambridge, are thinking a little bit more about what the pedagogical benefits of having um, audiovisual material mixed in with their written material is, and thinking about that whole flipping the classroom. And we talked a little bit about that actually at the conference last year. Um, just as to, you know, thinking about our market, our target market, um, 
And certainly, uh, I went to uh, Christopher and um, was it Kate session yesterday? Kate, sorry, on learning styles, and it was very much talking about you know who are the students uh, or who are the, even the young trainees or the young lawyers that we're getting in these days. Um, and we all talked about you know how many of you have watched a YouTube video to learn something recently. And certainly, you know, my observations of my daughters would be, um, certainly my youngest daughter drives me absolutely crazy because when she wants to learn to do something on Minecraft, she's there sitting watching a YouTube video. Um, or, you know, God forbid, if she wants to know what to carry on when she's going on her next flight, she watches a Zoella video. And it drives me crazy because her, my wife, her mother, is right there. You know, ask her what to put in the bag if you want to get on the plane, but no, it's, it's a Zoella video. So this is our target market, and certainly um, not supplementing classic uh, lectures, supervisions, classroom teaching with bite-sized audio and visual clips is going to be speaking to, um, to those students. And also, um, both in practice, if you've got lawyers that are just giving practical training to, but also our students, one of the things I've, again, experience over the course of the last couple of days is all of us talking very much about sort of reduced student contact time or reduced trainee contact time or reduced lawyer contact time. We, we don't have as much time to impart our experience and knowledge to them as we used to. Uh, just the people are busy, budgets are down, maybe staff numbers are down, um, and uh, legal methods teaching is not necessarily even as you know, comprehensive as it was uh, five or ten years ago. And it's, it's, you know, we're getting fewer opportunities, so the audio and visual stuff is going to let us hit them in a way that they're accustomed to um, absorbing information. Um, and also it, it gets you um, a little bit more in that sort of just-in-time method, doesn't it? It makes it available um, when they need it. Um, so I've been talking a little bit about academics, but of course in the practice sphere, what I'm hoping um, that you'll appreciate is that if we can come out with, you know, I'm thinking back to my practice experience, we used to churn out printed client notes telling them about new developments in legislation and things like that. And frankly, as a client, I think they'd probably far rather have a PDF where they could click on a section uh, that tells them about a new piece of legislation and they actually see the partner giving them a two-minute, you know, here's how this legislation is going to impact the mining industry, the aviation industry, the banking industry or whatever. Um, and that's going to allow them to form a connection that may be uh, productive from a marketing perspective. Um, again, you know, if you are looking at KM databases, what about a little video literally just capturing, you know, 15 minutes at the end of the transaction, what were your, why did you structure this transaction this way? Because again, for, in a KM database, we may be storing the Bibles, we may be storing the documentation, but we're not necessarily capturing the motivations behind how that deal was done. So all of these are places where, um, I hope we could think about making use of these sorts of things. So just very quickly, if this works, yes, I'm going to talk to you about two different ends of the kind of temporal scale that, um, that we've been using at Cambridge. The first is, and I hope you've already you know, have seen this, but maybe you haven't, we um, have a collection called the Eminent Scholars Archive. Um, because uh, actually, Leslie Dingle, who is sort of my co-founder of the Eminent Scholars Archive, has written a couple of articles about doing this for LIM, for the Legal Information Management Journal. So um, what we've done is we've interviewed now uh, 23 of our leading senior academics. And we're talking the, you know, octogenarians plus. The people who have maybe experienced the war, have experienced post-war legal development, have, form have really had... Um, you know, a huge input to the, into the way that the, the law is developed uh, in this country and internationally. Um, that content now has been accessed over 71,000 times. Um, it's a fantastic opportunity for you to get the recollections and feelings of these, um, at the moment I'm afraid, mainly guys, although we have just interviewed Rosalind Higgins, um, but just to sort of get in their own words uh, what their relationships were with other academics, what their, hang on a minute, uh, and what their other motivations were um, for doing those sorts of things. And we've captured amazing recollections from some of these people. Sadly, quite a few of them have now passed away. So we just believe that we've sort of captured that before they've gone. Um, at the moment, certainly, we are only capturing Eminent Scholars Archive in audio. Um, 
And uh, there's a reason for that that I'll, I'll come to in a second. Uh, but what we do is we put this into a system in the university called the Streaming Media Service, which we call the SMS. And the beauty of the SMS is it has a, uh, an RSS feed which then feeds into iTunes U. So iTunes U is the educational arm of the Apple iTunes um, platform. Um, so it used to be part of the, uh, if you're using a desktop app, it's still part of the iTunes app. If you open up iTunes, you start searching for educational material, you can find the iTunes U section. If you're using um, a device like an iPad, um, what you'll actually find is it actually got recently floated off. So you now need to install the iTunes U app. Um, but of course, uh, the, the beauty of iTunes is sort of twofold. The first is um, exposure, because it's, it's very easy to find for anyone using iTunes. Obviously, iTunes has a massive uh, usership around the world. Um, although, you are restricting yourself to Apple customers. Um, so, you're restricting yourself to that certain demographic of people that own Apple products. Um, so, actually, what I tend to find from our analytics is that's a lot of people in the U.S., um, maybe less so, certainly less so in developing nations for obvious reasons. Um, so that's obviously something you need to bear in mind. Um, the, gr the other great thing about iTunes U is people can very easily subscribe to a collection. So, um, in fact, you know, like the subscription button is, uh, is not here because that's the desktop app. But if I was to get the iPad out, you would see you can very easily subscribe to a collection that you're interested in. So if you have decided that um, legal biography and the Eminent Scholars Archive, and of course I wouldn't or encourage you to do so, you must do so straight away. Subscribe, open up your Apple item if you have one and subscribe to the Eminent Scholars Archive. And of course what that will mean is um, it's a push model at that point. If you're interested in that thing, as soon as you press subscribe, um, every time we release a new recording, there'll be a little icon on your app and it, it will download automatically. It's much better than the U2 album. It appears automatically on your iPad. Um, you get it automatically and then you can play it at your um, convenience. So, um, obviously, if we're talking about iTunes, and I'll move off this uh, as soon as possible because this is sort of single-sided only for the academic side because iTunes U is very much for academic um, institutions. Uh, we piggyback off the university's um, platform for this, uh, the streaming media service, but also their account on iTunes U. So, in the first <coughs> instance, what you would... Um, need to do is find out if you're in an academic institution whether your institution is already fielding an iTunes U account and whether you want to go in with them. Alternatively, of course, you know, if you were the Faculty of Law at the University of Birmingham and Birmingham already had an iTunes U Birmingham account, you might decide you want a Law Birmingham account rather than an iTunes, uh, rather than a Birmingham University account overall. It depends on what your relationship with your um, kind of higher level people in your institution are. Um, actually, if you want to, uh, you can actually then just go and get your own account if you're in an institution. So what I've got down in my notes here is if you Google iTunes U Public Site Manager Enrollment, you can then apply for an account. And you don't need a service like the streaming media service to host the, the content. You can just upload the stuff straight to iTunes and have it pop out of the, of the system there. So that's iTunes U Public Site Manager Enrollment should get you the top result. Okay, so just saying for, for the last time, we, we didn't use video for the Eminent Scholars Archive. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that, but largely um, that was because uh, there's actually a heck of a lot of editing. It's done impromptu. Although the um, scholars get to see their questions beforehand, um, they're kind of recollecting people and events and times and they stumble a bit and maybe they need a break occasionally. So there's actually quite a lot of editing going on with those. And that would have been very difficult to do um, with, a, with video footage. And um, we're moving a little bit now. You'll see there's a YouTube there. We're, we're doing little clips of video, but not a lot of, um, of video. So let's have a, a little look at something a little bit more up to date. Uh, actually, one story about the, um, the audio. Um, that we'll come into when we talk about editing later. But um, one of our eminent scholars had this uh, incredible grandfather clock in his room. <coughs> so the audio recording was sort of like, you know, hello, Professor Smith, uh, I'd like you to talk about your recollections of dealing with the International Criminal Court. And he would say, oh, yes, I don't know. And you could hear tick, 
Top. <laughs> Tick. Top. And of course, and then he wanted lots of edit. So there were little snippets out all the time. And of course, I was listening to this in, in the edit editing suite, and it would go tick, top, tick, top, tick, <laughs> top, tick. And it was like, this sounds terrible. So we had to line up every edit to a tick of the clock to make it. And that's why I didn't want to do it in video, because that would have been uh, an utter nightmare. OK, something more uh, recent, law in focus. Hopefully, again, something um, you might have uh, seen in the market, so to speak. Um, this is a primarily a YouTube uh, although we do feed it out through the uh, streaming media service, so it does go into iTunes U. But the great thing, of course, about YouTube is um, it's, it's available for everybody. It's sort of platform agnostic. You get it on your desktop, you get it on a Google phone. Um, blimey, you even get it on a... Well, actually, you don't get it on a Windows phone. Uh, you can access it on a Windows phone, but you don't get an app because Google hate um, Android, as far as I can tell. Uh, Google hate the Windows platform. So... Um, this basically came out of my frustration with our institutional inability to deal with situations in a timely manner, as I saw it. Because, you know, when we're always talking about um, saying to lawyers that they, you know, look at the newspaper, say to, say to students, you're applying to study law, look at the newspaper, every single page that you turn over will have a legal aspect to it. There's really interesting legal issues out there. And I would see these international and local issues going by, the bombing of Syria, you know, what, what's the international aspects of the bombing of Syria? Um, when the government couldn't get Abu Qatada out of the country, how, how is it possible that human rights in some way uh, stopped us from um, deporting somebody? Or um, Google Spain and Google being forced by a Spanish uh, court to remove uh, results from their search index. Um, and with all these things, you know, they're, they're really, really key issues. And I knew that our academics had... Um, have very valid uh, views and contributions to these issues. Um, but the fact was, although some of our academics are kind of there now and they're maybe tweeting or they're blogging, but still the primary, primary method of communication is writing an article, maybe writing a piece in a newspaper, that's a bit more contemporaneous, um, writing a section for a book, something like that. Something where you know, the, the feedback loop is, is more like six months or a year or maybe even longer before they actually get to comment on these things. So I, I tried to create Law in Focus to address this issue and basically what I've done is I've encouraged academics to draft, I, I think I started saying six minutes, it's kind of crept up to about eight to fifteen minutes because they all tell me they can't do it in a shorter time but I do keep pushing them back down again. Eight to fifteen minute effectively op-ed pieces. It's literally um, can turn it, you know, straight to camera, can turn it around quickly. Um, so this, um, we managed to post this one by Mark Elliott. Um, it was within, I think, 24 hours of the Conservative Party really going full on, yes, we're going to abolish the Human Rights Act. Um, and, and, you know, we can get out and address that issue um, as, as it unfolds, basically. Um, it is... A little, actually, talking about the length of these things for a second, uh, as I say, 8 to 15 minutes is going a little bit far. What I've actually got is this research. Um, so this is by a chap called Philip Guo. Uh, he's the Assistant uh, Professor of Computer Science at the University of Rochester. And he spent some time um, analysing the data produced by um, like the king, one of the king of MOOCs, uh, edX. Um, now, they obviously have an awful lot of um, internal data about how long people spend looking at online materials. And you can see from this graph, I mean, if you, if you want to have a read, um, by, by all means look him up. But this uh, is one of the most sort of impactful uh, results for me. And that is really that somewhere between sort of six to nine minutes is really the... the um, the sort of mean time that most people will spend watching or listening to something in an educational clip. So that's your target, really, if you're trying to get a message across. And this is, I mean, this is a real eye-opener, I think, for us um, when you're talking about um, uh, whether, you're, whether you're in an academic institution that already records lectures or whether they're thinking about recording lectures or whether you're thinking about recording teaching or whether you're thinking about supplementing teaching with additional recorded material six to nine minutes, you know, we're thinking about recording a 55-minute lecture. Um, it's just not going to fit in with this, you know, with the attention spans and the desired 
um, kind of appetite of the of the people we're looking at. So um, there's a really interesting thing. If I get time later, I'll show you. YouTube actually gives you analytics for what your retention rate is. So it will tell you what percentage of viewers have watched your video for what percentage of the time that it is available. And it's a very depressing curve because, I mean, obviously, I, what anybody gets is, they, you know, a lot of people will make a sort of two or three second. I mean, I'm sure you've all landed on a YouTube video and gone, oh, what have I ended up here on, you know, and, and gone off again. So that it kind of crashes down and then kind of evens off. Um, but it's actually really useful for you to work out, you know, if someone's saying something or, uh, you know, just to look at your product and then figure out, gosh, is there something that's really making people suddenly stop the video or something? Um, so if I get a chance to show you later, and if the internet's working on the, on the computer, I can show you that. Um, so notwithstanding the fact that this is not the ideal length, the uh, law in focus, again, we've had over 113,000 views on that now. Um, and actually, one academic has uh, remarked to me uh, that his Law in Focus video has had a circulation roughly approximating to the last textbook he wrote. So he's very pleased because I should think the textbook took rather a lot more effort than the 15 minutes it took him to record the Law in Focus. Um, okay, as I said, we distribute it through YouTube and the streaming media service and um, iTunes U. So let's talk about some of the practicalities for a second. Um, audio recording. I am audio recording as we speak. Um, the key to getting a really good audio recording is getting, well, there's two really, is getting a, a decent audio recording device and then getting it as close to the speaker as possible. Um, so you can use, uh, a lot of you will have seen lavalier microphones. You see them on television programs, you know, little thing, clippy things. But I even noticed, um, if you were in the leadership stream earlier, um, Sorry, I forgot that lady's name now. I don't know the names. I don't do names well. Jane. Jane. It was really rustling quite badly as she was moving around and talking. It would catch. Um, it, sometimes you catch people breathing. So the, the kind of it's uh, and also if you're videoing somebody, I don't know about you, but I still find it a bit distracting if I can see this little microphone w wiggling around. So you can do a, a lavalier microphone, but um, what I've actually found is uh, you know a good little small external dedicated recorder works really well uh, so I'm going to introduce you to my personal favorite the zoom h1 okay it's not this big in real life don't worry because um, that would be quite scary I don't think you get ever get anyone speaking to that um, it's a fantastic little thing it actually looks well more like that okay there's a there's an awful lot of benefits to this thing it's cheap okay even though it's got pretty chunky little microphones on there. It's about £80 for a recorder. So you can afford to have, well, depending on your budget, obviously, but typically you can afford to have like one or two around um, for use. The quality of the recording on that in comparison to what you get uh, in a cheaper recorder is actually really, really good. We've um, tested sort of dictaphones and things like that. And, and a dictaphone, it's very tempting to go for a little dictaphone that's just got an on-off button. It's really simple but that is designed to be held right to the mouth, whereas this, as you can see, is a sound field recorder, so it will pick me up quite nicely just at this sort of distance. It's small, it's light, it has a tripod mount on the bottom, so you can screw it to a little tripod like that, or you can screw it to a big tripod. You know, I could have this thing poking right into my face here on a big tripod. Records to a memory card, so it's solid state recording. So, and the, the great thing about memory cards these days is they're probably giving them away uh, out in the conference. I mean, they are so cheap. The one in there is a 32 gig memory card, and basically, when you switch it on, it says you can do 99 days, 99 hours, and 99 minutes of recording, or something like that. The, basically, the amount of time that you can record for is, is, is you know, irrelevant at that point. So, you know, we can leave that on all day for a whole conference, and you can just leave it recording, and then just chop them all chop all the recordings up at the end of the day. It's very simple to use, which is very important. Uh, if, it depends on who you are, uh, but certainly I give these out to students and computing officers, so you can make your own mind up about the uh, level of technical ability. It has a large red button on the top. You press the large red button, it starts recording, and there's a flashing red light. You press the, the red button, it stops. That, that is also great. And then the last thing about this thing is it has what's called automatic levels. Okay, and what that means is it knows how loud the thing it's hearing is and it increases the gain, so it increases its ability to record stuff if it's quiet. So if I walk over here 
and talk and it thinks, oh, Daniel's got a little bit quieter, it'll raise the, the levels. Now, obviously, the more it raises the levels, the more you also get a little bit of background hiss or whatever. Um, but it just gives you that confidence in knowing that you don't have to set the thing up. It kind of does it for itself. So if you've got somebody who speaks very quietly and they're whispering a little bit, it will sort that out for you. It will raise it up. Now, obviously, it's always better to get as much voice as possible in comparison to the background, but it will at least give you the insurance that it will hear something rather than um, you know, being very low. So you can capture all the audio um, with that, and I'll talk about sort of processing and editing a little bit later. Uh, but let's move on to uh, the video, because this is where it gets really good. So, one question to you straight away. Who can tell me what they think makes an excellent video? What makes the best, in terms of production quality, what makes great video? Is it great lighting? But go on. No, 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 no. Just, you know, is makeup, hair, background? Having people in it? Yeah, absolutely. Great answer. What for me, what makes great video? Actually, great audio. And there is quite a lot of um, research that shows that, in fact, I've got it here. This is a really interesting book, okay? This is a, a book written about, as you can see, how people react and interact with media. Okay, it's called The Media Equation. And what um, these uh, authors, uh, Reeves and Nass, found was that um, audio fidelity attracts attention to media. I think that's really true. You, you, know, you see an awful lot of videos out there where you can see a lot of effort has been put into framing the video, but the audio is almost a sort of second consideration or third consideration or the last consideration. I thought, oh, well, as long as you can hear the words. Whereas actually, I find you can, you can have some really ropey video. If you've got good quality audio, then the engagement level is still there. As you can see, uh, the other benefit, of course, is if we're talking about teaching or sales or communications, audio fidelity affects people's ability to record, to recall that information. So it effectively, you're managing your impact um, in that way. Okay? Um, so... Basically, what they're saying with their research is we will be making a poor impression if we don't have great audio. Um, so, uh, actually, I'm going to see whether this works. Um, so, I'm going to compare a video here. Okay, here is the Law in Focus video, okay? And what I'm going to compare is... Um, I, I would never use the microphone in a camera. It's quite handy because it's there and you're pointing the camera at somebody and the microphone's there. But the fact is, on the whole, when you get a microphone and a camera, it's very small, it's very cheap, and it is packed right next to a huge amount of electronic equipment, which is exactly where you don't want a microphone to be. So um, what I've got here is, this is Mark Elliott uh, recording his Law in Focus, and uh, you can't quite see the, the title there. This is the audio that came out of the camera in the first instance, okay? So let's... In some countries... Bills of rights yeah, yeah. Those repositories of those values that are held to be most precious. Oh, he won't like me for pausing it there. Okay. Um, you can hear what he's saying. He's talking about bills of rights. They're venerated. It's okay. And then... In the United Kingdom, in contrast, the Human Rights Act, the closest thing that we have... I could listen to that all day. And actually, then I could watch that all day because Mark's got a great voice. That's what came out of this. So that's off the camera. I get pretty tired of that. But in this presentation, I'll try to answer three key and that, questions. He's not mic'd up. That's this well, sitting next to him. Because it's head and shoulders, the, the microphone's quite close to him. But it's out of shot. Don't need to worry about freaking him out by miking him up or anything like that. It's just um, using a different recorder. In some countries, bills of rights are venerated as repositories of those values that are held to be most precious. In the United Kingdom, in contrast, the Human Rights Act, the closest thing that we have to a Bill of Rights in the modern sense, has been a source of bitter contention ever since its enactment. Against this background, the Conservative Party said in its election manifesto that it would repeal the Act and replace it with the British Bill of Rights. In this presentation, I'll try to answer three key questions that these proposals invite. First, 
What are the perceived problems with the Act? So, uh, I say, doing this, recording a separate audio and video, this is where the technology has come on so far recently um, with all the kind of, um, now that we're doing everything digitally and we're doing everything on to um, solid state, uh, because what I've actually got, another video clip, which I probably don't have time to show you, is what it's like when the lips get out of sync with the, with the audio, which I'm sure you've all have experienced at some point. It's terrible, and it is really impossible to watch. And that's what used to happen when we used to record anything on tape, because every analogue device records things at a slightly different speed. No problem these days, because once you're recording on a hard a memory card with the camera and a memory card with the audio recorder, you sync it, sync it up once at the beginning, you can leave it going for a couple of hours and the lips are still in sync when you get to the end, which is a huge relief, I have to say. Um, okay, so, oh, we'll move on to that in a second. Um, this is basically, um, my analysis of the internet is, uh, basically if you, if you have a cat in your presentation or if you have a cat you're going to be uh, popular and successful. Um, that's basically, I've distilled the internet into, into one basic slide. Um, but there is a reason for this, okay? Um, just to talk about the cameras for a little minute, you've got, uh, you've got three options. You can use a video camera, which is uh, relatively easy to operate. But what they tend to give you is a very soft, um, you know, everything's in focus, uh, Typically, you get less control over the final look unless you spend a really large amount of money. Um, you can use a phone, which up until relatively recently was a pretty laughable suggestion. Um, but with the latest generation of phones, so the iPhone 6, the Samsung Galaxy S6, the Note, the Galaxy Note, they all have got excellent phones in. And the University of Cambridge communications team very much use iPhone 6s when they're out and about doing field work these days. You can get an extremely creditable result from a phone, but again, you've got absolutely no control over what it looks like. And then finally, what I would recommend these days is um, a, a, what's called a DSLR camera, which is just a standard camera, which looks like that, okay? One of the real benefits of using one of these, or buying one of these, having one of these in the office, is you can just take pictures as well. So if anyone ever asks you for a photograph of anything, you can just use it to take a picture. But these do now, the vast majority of them, have amazing video capabilities. Um, this is the one I um, certainly would recommend to absolutely anybody who's asking. Uh, this is the Canon D700, uh, 700D, sorry. And the beauty with this is it has an articulated screen, and it's a touch screen. And when you put it into video mode and manual, you can change all of the settings on the touch screen with, you basically touch the bit you want to change and move the wheel. So, and you see on the screen what it's doing. So if you think, oh, this video looks a bit dark, you can change the exposure and you can change the wheel until it looks bright enough on the screen. So it's really easy to know what it is you're gonna get out of the camera. Okay, I'm not probably gonna to speak too much about the lenses. Um, because I doubt I have time. I, if it hasn't already become obvious, I could easily speak right up until the President's dinner about all this stuff, <laughs> um, which I suspect you'll start throwing stuff at me. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on relatively quickly, but if, if this stuff uh, interests you and you think you can use it, um, what I suspect is you just need to get it on my table at the President's dinner, and I'll probably just keep talking about it. Um, so the reason I put the cat slide in is... Um, this is a great demonstration of what we call depth of field, okay, or depth of focus, because the cat is beautifully in focus, but his paw is out of focus because it's coming towards you. That is what using a DSLR can give you when you're doing the video, okay? And that comes from um, setting what's called the aperture on the uh, camera. So if any of you are, are, are keen photographers, you'll know that you can get um, different apertures on the lenses just to really confuse matters. A, the aperture is like the pupil of the eye. It's how much the lens is open, so how much light gets in there. Um, a smaller number of aperture is a larger gap on the, on the lens, just to really confuse matters. But the lower the aperture, the bigger the gap on the lens, the more you get depth of focus like this. So this will be a relatively shallow depth of field, um, and therefore it's a relatively large aperture, small number aperture. So that will be a, an f2 or an f2.4 um, photograph or something like that. And you can do exactly the same with your video. So um, if we actually have a look at a comparison here, they'll hate me for this as well. Lewis on the left here is a student who's talking about his interview. Um, 
whereas Catherine here is a, a very uh, eminent EU professor, so she's talking about um, something interesting about the EU, I'm sure. Um, can you see the difference here? Okay, what we've got is Lewis was shot with a video camera, so all of the books behind him are perfectly in focus. Um, it doesn't, and that means he's not necessarily well separated from the background. You don't get that kind of filmic view um, of a nice blurry background, but the subject being in focus. Whereas Catherine is in our legal history room. She does have law books behind her, because of course that's what you need to have behind you when you're shooting a law video. Um, but you can't read the titles on them, because the depth of focus has been adjusted so that that all sort of goes into the background there. Okay, um, so I was going to talk about how you actually do that, but let's move on. So going back to how we've actually set those videos up, the Law in Focus uses what we call the long side interview. And again, we've been doing this with the, uh, the bile. It means you're not necessarily looking straight at the camera. Straight at the camera is fine for some uses, but not necessarily all uses. Basically, if you think about this, this is the long side interview, it looks like they're being interviewed by somebody. They don't necessarily have to be interviewed by somebody, but it looks like they're imparting knowledge to somebody that they're talking to. Um, you can do that with a single speaker like this. Obviously, it's far more difficult if you want to have two or more people in the slide. Okay, but I chose this um, because I thought it was suitable for the law in focus. Um, if you compare that again to... Um, uh, where were we? To Lewis's video. He's a direct-to-camera. And that's, it's just a case of thinking about these things before you start. The reason we did uh, direct-to-camera for Louis is he's talking to somebody about their interview. He's saying, this is what my experience of the interview will be like. This is what it will be like for you. So he's engaging effectively one person when you're watching that video. He's saying to you, this is what your interview might be like. Whereas Catherine is saying, well... Um, you know, I want to talk for a little bit about the Human Rights Act. She's not talking to you about the Human Rights Act. She's talking about her experiences of the Human Rights Act. Um, so it, it, you've got to think about how you want to um, lay these things out. The other thing about laying these things out goes back to the slide I just skipped over, which is a very well-known photography method called the rule of thirds. So basically what, you, what the rule says is you divide the... Um, field into thirds, which effectively gives you those two lines on either um, axes, and basically what you want is the subject to fit those lines. So can you see here, uh, Jean Nolt here has got her face down the line there on the right hand side, and she's got her eyes on the line going across the top, and that is very much a sort of general rule of thumb that you can use to compose a shot, because I think the first the first in sort of natural reaction people have is to whack the subject right in the middle because they are the thing you're supposed to be looking at. And it's actually quite disconcerting when you see something like that, even if they're talking to camera, uh, although this is another long-sided interview. So again, can you see here, although this has been slightly squashed in terms of the um, aspect ratio, they're roughly down the right-hand side. Don't have to be the right, it could be the left, but you've got those third lines to think about while you're there. Okay? Um, Right. <clears throat> Put simply, I have found that lawyers need scripts. Okay? I think it was, um, you know, I, I said the Eminent Scholars Archive, they're talking a little bit more, but Law in Focus, what you've got is you've got someone trying to impart a complex issue in as short a time as possible because they've got me going, keep it short, keep it short, keep it short, six to nine minutes. They want to be precise, they don't want to make any mistakes, they need to be extremely efficient with their words. And I think it was, um, it was Mark Twain who said, I didn't have time to write a short letter, so I wrote a long letter. Okay? We always used to get told when I was doing my LPC, writing the short memos were the hard ones. Writing a long memo is easy. Getting it down and concise is hard. So um, what I actually do for, um, for Law and Focus, and for quite a lot of the other things we produce, is you can let people write a script, and then actually we use an auto cue. And that, again, is not something that you have to spend huge amounts of money in. You don't need a film studio and a clapperboard and, and a, uh, everything else. Um, this piece of software, MirrorScript Pro, very simple, free. Um, basically, you put the script in there, you decide what your text size is going to be, and you can play with that. And then you click on Start, the screen goes blank, and the script starts rolling up. Okay, And then what I get is you get a Bluetooth keyboard or a keyboard with a long cable, and you can 
speed it up, you can see that it's, if you press space, it stops. If you press U and D, it goes up and down. If you press plus and minus, it goes faster or slower. So you can go and you can adjust the recording of the script as people are speaking, and it comes up and down. Again, I, I could have showed you that, but I don't think I have the time. It's remarkably simple. Alternatively, most of us have got iPads around now. There's a lot of teleprompter software out there where the basic version is free, and then you're only really looking at about six or seven pounds for some of these things. Um, and again, you know, the, it's literally a case. I mean, how long would it take me to get this thing up and running? There's a script going up straight away. Again, Bluetooth keyboard would scroll it up and down faster or slower. So you could stand that um, near the camera or off to the side if you're doing a long side interview. Uh, this one, I haven't tried this one yet, but this one promises to do voice recognition and therefore move this at the same speed as the person is speaking, which means you don't even need the Bluetooth keyboard and the human being anymore to make the thing run at the right speed. So I haven't played with that yet. If you want to, the amazing thing is, you can even get one of these these days, okay? It's, a t it's an auto prompt like you get in a television studio. It's got an iPad at the bottom, so you basically put that app in and put your iPad at the front, and that piece of kit starts at, I mean, just that one, at 500 pounds, and you put your camera in the back, you obviously have to provide the iPad, you don't get the iPad for 500 pounds, but that means you can do the direct-to-camera piece with the script going down the front of the glass, looking through it, it's not expensive money these days, it's not, um, you know, it's not big, big bucks, film studio type thing. Captions. This is the other significant benefit of working from a script, because I don't know whether you've ever noticed, how many people have ever noticed this tiny little button down here on YouTube? It's a closed captions button. So YouTube will provide subtitles for video. Subtitles obviously provide a heck of a lot of benefit in terms of accessibility, searchability, um, ease of use. The other great thing about captions is Google, you know, because so you've got Google Translate, you paste a bit of text in, it will translate it, turns it into a different language. Once you've got captions on a YouTube video, you can then choose a different language and it translates the captions into a different language so someone can be reading the text of your video while watching the video. That's great, and that's where having a script really comes into it because I just want to show you, and I'm, 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 how, what, how am I doing for time? We've got 15 minutes till the end. Okay, right, let me show you this. Uh, where are we? Here we go. Right. If you don't put your own script into YouTube, Google will have a go at working out what it was the person was saying anyway. Now, this is Professor James Crawford. He is now a judge of the International Court, and therefore he speaks pretty good English. Uh, let me have a very quick look at what Google thinks he is saying. Turning to the, question, the two questions which are somewhat more depth. The first is the European Convention of Human Rights. It's not bad. Well, what happened with Montenegro is like... Then it gets a bit of a problem. Okay, and I haven't picked this particular spot, but Mont mountains instead of Montenegro probably does change the meaning of the text slightly. Okay, so we haven't transcribed that one. Compare that to this one. We do try and transcribe all of the um, law and focuses. Yes, that's fantastic. Okay, and that is because Joe is reading from a script, and therefore we had the script put in. And I'll show you in a few minutes how easy it is to apply a script to the YouTube video. So that's actually that little icon down there turns subtitles on and off for videos. The other great benefit is, as I said, you've got this transcription thing, the translation thing. Of course, if you've got the automated transcription, just imagine, you know, talk about the rubbish in, rubbish out process. If you've got an automatic transcription in the first place, just think, once Google has mangled it once, when it mangles it a second time to translate it into a different language, I mean, I, I only speak one language, so I can't actually check this, but I can have a rough guess at what it's probably going to be doing in terms of whether it's going to be legible. So I would absolutely recommend making sure that you get a script. And if you've got the script, you can obviously then make use of the, um, the uh, teleprompt, uh, which gives people confidence and allows them 
um, to, to d tackle issues uh, you know, in an easy way, and it does mean you then get your closed captions at the end as well. Okay, so I was going to talk a little bit uh, just quickly. Ah, you see, I was going to use my clicker then, and then I realised it's not going to work because I'm not in PowerPoint anymore. Okay, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time teaching you about video editing because you know what you can do? You can pick a piece of video software and then where could you go to learn how to use it? <laughs> YouTube. Okay, so there's lots of great video. Again, you don't need to spend vast amounts of money on video editing software. The other great thing about almost all of these um, companies are they all provide free trials. So you can have a go at this software for like a month, cut a few bits of a video together, see what it looks like. Um, you know, most of them will just give you that opportunity, it's pretty much full featured, um, full featured editing. And for the kind of things we're going to be doing for educational video, unless you decide to get really carried away, um, what you really want to do is, do you want to be able to cut? Do you want to be add, able to add bits together? Do you want to be able to maybe fade to black and fade to black again? You, can, you, know, you don't want to be doing a lot of fancy stuff. Any one of these editors will do that stuff and do it very simply. The only thing you really want, if you're following what I've been talking about, is you want to add the audio as a different track. And again, any basic home-level editor will do that now, will allow you to lay on more tracks. And all you have to do is um, find a point in the audio, typically the point where the person starts, where they say, today I'm going to talk about, and you get the T from today, and then you line up the audio with the video where they said today and then it goes along. And then you turn the audio off on the video track and you use the audio from your recorder and away you go. It doesn't take anything more advanced than that. There's um, some audio editing software. These are the only two I would really uh, recommend. Audacity you can't go wrong with because it's free. It's the best price of all. It's free. Uh, Audition comes with the Adobe Creative Cloud. It's very not free. Um, but if you have a site license or something like that, then by all means use it. The great thing about both of these pieces of software, and again, I don't have time to actually show you how to do it, but they both do amazing noise reduction. And how noise reduction works these days is, I mean, they don't take out things like my clock that I had earlier. They don't take out irregular noises like that. We were recording something yesterday, the police siren went past. You can't magically get rid of a police siren from the back of a recording. But if you're in a room where there's an air conditioning unit that's humming, or even I've sat that there by the laptop, and the laptop is humming, so when I turn up the volume and I'm listening to my audio edit, there'll be a hmm in the background. That would be really annoying to me. So what you can do is, you wait for a second. So there's a nice, quiet bit of audio footage. There we go. So when I get to my recording at the end, there's going to be a nice, normally I just leave the recorder on for 10 minutes before we start. You get a baseline of what the noise in the room is like, and then you, with both these pieces of software, again, look at YouTube how to do this, you highlight a bit of the basic level audio from the room, and then you say, that's the noise. Nothing, no one's speaking, that's just what the room sounds like. And then you say, I want to remove that noise. And it processes the whole soundtrack, and it takes out high-pitched noises, humming, whistling, or whatever. It d won't take out the alarms or the... You know, you need to be listening when you're recording something, and if something comes up, you need to take that out yourself or uh, we'll go back and re-record it again. YouTube. I'm going to talk about YouTube. I'm going to talk about account verification in a minute, but I've been mainly used talking about YouTube as a method of delivery. Am I on? Five? Oh, seven minutes. Seven okay. <laughs> okay. Why do you choose YouTube as a method of uh, delivery? It's free. It's extremely robust. You can, if any of you have ever tried hosting video files locally, you, get, you upset IT people very rapidly if you try to move audio or video files around your network. Um, I used to, very early on, I used to tuck them away on a secret part of our faculty website that the computing officer didn't know about. Um, and then I, I got a phone call because he was trying to back up the web server and the, and the website had literally like quadrupled in size because obviously in comparison to a nice text-based website, you put one video up and the size it just blows the whole thing out of proportion. He's like, it's taking me two hours to back up the website, what have you done? <laughs> um, so you want to get this stuff off site. Obviously the only issue about getting it off site, if you're in practice especially, you may need to consider the data protection issue. Um, 
and whether you are storing any kind of personal or corporate information, you may find that you need to uh, consider whether that goes outside your private network. Great thing about YouTube, again, is it's flexible. It doesn't really matter what kind of file formats you, you throw into it. Um, it's got amazing embedding or sharing options. So you'll see YouTube videos all over the place. You don't just have to go to YouTube to get them, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. It's familiar for users. It's where the users are. If I'm saying to you, go and find out how to re um, remove noise in Audacity, you don't go to Vimeo to do that. Um, you know, Vimeo is a lovely platform, but the fact is my daughter doesn't go to Vimeo to watch Zoella videos. She goes to YouTube, so it's going where the users are. Um, uh, again, with distribution, you just need to compare the numbers. You know, I've got a couple of our faculty videos on Vimeo. They've probably done about two, three, four hundred views. I put something on YouTube and we're looking at two, three, four thousand, five thousand, you know. That if someone's going to be searching for something, I mean obviously you've got the whole um, anti-competitive, um, antitrust thing with YouTube that realistically if someone does a search for the search terms that are in your video, you know, your video is Southampton Law, how to find a case on West Law, you can search for those things, YouTube is the result that's going to come up first if you put your uh, content on there. Um, so, just to talk about verification for a minute, because uh, anyone can get a YouTube account, you just need a Google account, which is a Gmail account, so almost everybody has one. You may want to open one uh, for your uh, institutional organisation if you don't already have one. But you do want to get your account verified, because there are some significant benefits to being verified. Um, there's the, the, the two top ones here, you get custom thumbnails. Okay, and so that is, you know, when you get a, a, a list of YouTube results and you see the little picture of what the video is going to be about. Um, and some of them, they look awful, and some of them, they look good. And I guarantee you that all the ones that look good are using custom thumbnails rather than original thumbnails. So an example of that would be, where are we? Here we go. Okay, here's the Law in Focus video we were looking at earlier. Here are the three automatic um, thumbnails that YouTube wanted to use from my video. He's got his eyes closed, he looks gormless, he looks gormless, <laughs> and then there's a nice picture that I've put in that looks nice. Okay, and I can only specify that because I have this verified account. Um, the other benefit of the verified account is you can put in videos that are longer than 15 minutes. I mean, obviously, you need to think about whether you should be putting in videos longer than 15 minutes, but at least it means you're not restricted. And then there's loads of stuff you don't really, really don't care about, and I'm not going to talk about now. Five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> OK. This is how you get verified on YouTube. It sounds complicated, but it's actually remarkably simple. You go to that web address, and they text you a code, and you put the code in, and you get verified. The thing is, it's kind of mysterious. People never... It's basically you go to YouTube to verify and you go through the process and it's a one-off process and then you are a blessed YouTube user. You get all the additional uh, benefits. Okay. Um, I've shown you how... Uh, I've talked about the transcript. The, thing about, the other thing about YouTube um, which is really useful is there are three different levels of access for videos. And that again is something that you can think about uh, with regards... Um, when you're making these things available. So the three settings are private, which means only you as the owner of the account can see it. So that's great when you're editing the metadata, you're putting in the description, you're having a little fiddle with all the keywords and stuff like that. You want it private. Nobody in the world can see it. You've got public. That is, everybody in the world can see this video. It will appear, if anyone subscribed to you, they will get it. Um, it will appear if they search for your things or they browse for your thing or if it gets suggested as a video of something else. Anyone in the world can see it. But then in between, you've got something called unlisted. And unlisted is security by obscurity. Your YouTube video exists, it's publicly available, but if you don't know the address, you will never find it. Because it won't appear in search results, you can't browse to it, you can't, it doesn't get suggested to you in any other thing. So it's effectively like having a private YouTube video, you can circulate the link. So what you can do is you can make the video unlisted and then send it to the person who's in it. And they can watch it, maybe they can show it to their friend or their wife, you know, check that they're happy with it. They can see it on YouTube, but nobody else can find it at that point. And unlisted is a great halfway house if you want to put like, links on your VLE 
If you want to embed a video on your VLA, maybe you don't ever want this video to be public, you can still use YouTube as the hosting facility by making your video unlisted in the first instance. Uh, actually, the one biggest gotcha with using YouTube that um, is just a kind of slightly artificial, but I understand why they've done it, you cannot replace a video on YouTube once you've uploaded it. So if you give someone a link to something, or you publish a video, and you then you realize, oh, it's got a terrible mistake in, I need to re-edit that video, you can't replace the video. As far as I can tell, that is so that people don't replace like, the world's most popular cat video with an advert for washing soap at some point in the future. You know, you can't bait and switch. But it does mean you need to know that that video is right, or you need to give somebody a new link, or you need to change your embed code if that's what you've done with the video afterwards. Okay. Um, this is just talking a little bit about distribution. Because once you've got your video on YouTube, it's really extremely easy to distribute it. You know, I haven't done anything fancy to get the video of Mark there into our Facebook account. I just put the link to Facebook. I haven't done something amazing to embed the video um, into our Twitter stream. I just put the link to his video and Twitter. Because, again, because of the, uh, in, because of the um, penetration of YouTube, everybody recognizes a YouTube link. And therefore, a lot of people do richer things with it um, than just providing the link. Now, obviously, again, you could just put a link into your VLE or your intranet or whatever and send people off. But you're going to get a much better impact if the person, you know, if you can just embed the video right into your platform and they can just click play and they get it. You know, it, it doesn't take much thought about human nature to realize that that big picture of Mark smiling with the play button on is going to pull people in a lot more than, oh, I'm going to go to YouTube and go and watch that thing somewhere else. Okay. Um, on YouTube itself, again, I'm probably teaching you to suck eggs here, but when you're actually on a video, um, basically what you've got down at the bottom is, and obviously it doesn't matter whether this is listed or unlisted, you've got your share menu down here. And then you've got the link straight away, but then you've got embed as well. So if you're using um, if you're using an intranet or a VLE or whatever, that piece of code there will provide you with a little player um, that's embedded in that in that um, resource. And if you do show more, you can choose different sizes of the video and stuff like that, and it will show you how that works. There we go. You can see. Look, I can choose. Choose the size, choose whether it adds additional things around the outside and stuff like that. Okay. Um, did you, you said five minutes already, didn't you? Yeah, we have thought about. <laughs> so depending on how... I really have. Listen all day. <laughs> I, that's very kind of you. I really... Can everybody else listen? I have no concerns if you need to get up and go and find a cup of coffee or have a shower before the presence dinner or whatever, but I am going to go for maybe three more minutes. I just want to talk a little bit about um, one other video. So we were talking, I was talking about the, um, the subtitles and uh, which one is it? Ah, not that one. Where is it? This one. Okay. And analytics. Okay. So here is um, a video by uh, Professor Feldman. He's talking about whether we could deport Abu Qatada uh, under the Human Rights Act. And it's, you know, you get a heck of a lot of data about this is just the summary page. You know, when you look down the side there, I can look at demographics, I can look at where the traffic is coming from, so I can see where my markets are. And this is a very sort of general one, so you can see there we're getting um, a very disproportionate range of gender, actually. <coughs> I might need to have a think about that. You can see the, ge the geographic um, spread there. It's mainly the US, um, the United Kingdom, Canada, France, um, and you can see whether people are watching it on YouTube or, or whether they're using a mobile device, all those sorts of things. Okay, this is another video uh, by Professor Feldman. And I was actually contacted by one of our PhD students um, who was Russian. And he'd gone back to Russia and he said, oh, I saw that the day that Professor Feldman has done this video. And it's, it's, it's a really important, interesting um, issue that we're struggling with in Russia. Would you mind if I provided a Russian transcription? of his video to make it accessible for Russian viewers. And of course, I said, of course, you know, that's why. It was technically very complicated because obviously it's using the Cyrillic alphabet in set. So I couldn't even check whether the timings were right. But he provided these, um, this transcript 
And then when you actually have a look at the analytics of this one, look at where most of our traffic's coming from. Because we've got, so we've got Kazakhstan and Russia are now the second and third most common people watching this video. So the, you know, the impact of having actual natural language uh, transcriptions for those countries, because that's a target country for that video, has been really, you know, had a real impact. We've seen that um, in the demographics there. Um, let me think about what else is worth covering in the very limited time that I have left. Um, oh yeah, I, I'll tell you what I will just show, just for, just for the laugh, look, audience retention. Okay, I told you it was depressing. Um, the one thing you will learn about audi audience retention, right, that, I have to tell you, he is absolutely bang on the um, YouTube average there, look. Um, but as you can see, within the first... Um, as soon as he starts talking, he's lost 10% of his audience, uh, audience, okay? That is, as I say, you know, I don't think that's a, a comment on poor David um, himself. That is just a comment on the fact that quite a lot of people find themselves on a video and then just didn't intend to be there in the first place. So that first 10% is probably just people that maybe didn't expect to be there in the first place. But after that, he's pretty much, you know, retained... Once he's actually got them, he's pretty much got them. So... The, the, the key point for that is when you're getting somebody set up for a video or if you're recording a video yourself is get to the point. You know, really try and get the viewers hooked on as quickly as possible with what you're going to tell them uh, about and how useful um, the video is going to be to them. Um, so I was going to talk a little bit about um, one other thing to do with YouTube, which is the fact that it provides you with comments as well. Now, um, there was one, I just wanted to bring my last slide in. Uh, there is one um, description that most people use for YouTube comments. That is what most people consider to be YouTube comments. They consider YouTube comments to be a sewer, which is to be avoided at all costs. But the fact is, again, what YouTube comments allows, what YouTube as a platform provides, is for that discussion of the content. It allows for um, people to uh, interact in a way that is attached to the video um, that is extremely valuable. Now, we've obviously done YouTube. We talked about it. It is a video platform. We've talked about iTunes, which is an audio and video platform, but tied to Apple. The other one that I will probably leave you just to um, explore by yourselves is SoundCloud. And SoundCloud is effectively like <laughs> YouTube because it's cross-platform, um, but it just does audio. Uh, it began as a, an opportunity for indie bands to get their music out into the market, but it's very much sort of branching out into, um, in, into sort of spoken word now as well. And the great thing about SoundCloud is, as I say, you can get apps across all the different platforms. So if you're a, an Android phone user or, oh God forbid, a Windows phone user, I think you can get an app and you can subscribe to a collection. So again, here's an example of one of the University of Cambridge collections, and you can favourite that collection, and that means you've subscribed to it, and again you get that, um, that sort of push model of those sorts of things. So that is a really extremely basic and fast, you're kind of looking at me with that, yes, it's time. Um, now, it's an introduction to some of the platforms, um, some of the considerations that you've got when preparing for the recording, some of the toys and the kit that you might need, how you might think about using um, that sort of content for your organisations, whether that's for education, or for training, or for communications, PR type purposes, or, or to build your profile. Um, now, I don't imagine anyone can possibly tolerate me answering questions at this point, but I'm, I'm happy. Uh, otherwise, I'm sure, hang on, there we go. I'm at db298 at cam.ac.uk, or I'm on Twitter at db298. By all means, I am happy to answer questions you know, over the coming days and weeks and months, or I am at the President's dinner this evening. I would happily yammer on about this stuff at the President's Dinner as well. <laughs>